We rarely get rained in Southern California, but this time my car day was rained out. And to get any work done in this little two car garage, I usually have to push at least one of the cars out in the driveway. That's a problem. This one doesn't have windows. This one has no windows in the driver's door either. In years past, I've made an end of the year video like market review on Porsche hot rods, and those are really fun. But this time I'm gonna do something a little different and talk about the Porsche parts market and what it's like to restore a car and where to find the parts. My 911 Mac started out as a stripped out shell and so it needed all the parts. I'm gonna share with you all my thoughts on how I shop and collect for parts and really my opinion on the Porsche tax. What is the Porsche tax? Well, pretty much anything with the Porsche name or a Porsche part number typically costs more. Here's an example of a Porsche brake caliper for a run of the mill 1983 Porsche 911 SC. This is one caliper only, 869. Porsche didn't even make that brake caliper, ATE did. They still sell the caliper for 481, one side only for the same year car. ATE also made brake calipers for other companies like Mercedes Benz. Their genuine caliper today is only $288. Same with BMW. Genuine caliper made by the same supplier, 727. Another great example is for my 3.2 liter engine for Porsche, has a crank position sensor. That part is $320 from Porsche. That sensor is made by Bosch and Bosch also makes the same exact sensor for BMW. I'm told the wire is about a half an inch longer, but the price is only $87 or you can get the same sensor with the correct length wire made for a 911 for $176. Another example is a clutch cable for a Porsche 911, $203. There is an aftermarket one available for 91 by Gemmo. Gemmo also makes clutch cables for Volkswagen. This is for a VW Vanagon around the same year, $17.50. So there seems to be a pattern with almost all Porsche parts. They're more expensive. For example, on my 356, I did not buy new calipers. I rebuilt my original calipers with ATE components for less than $50. This news about the Porsche tax can be a little discouraging, but the optimist inside me says that it's just a game and two can play at that game. Rule number one is don't throw anything away. Anything Porsche has value. A one way to combat this kind of inflated Porsche tax is you have to be willing to not only buy, but also to sell. So my, my method is to kind of trade up, kind of like the story of the kid with the paperclip who eventually trades and buys a house. Similar method for cars. So sometimes along the journey, you end up buying stuff that you really don't need. And a good example of that is when I went to Denver to get the engine. I wanted the engine, but it came with a whole truckload of stuff that I didn't really need. But that stuff has value and it does offset the cost of the engine. This method certainly isn't for everybody. It no doubt takes patience and time. And I'm sort of, I guess, glutton for punishment. I don't know. I'm also attracted to junk. So what I'm talking about works for me. Other people will go about it different ways. The end product, you know, costs more than it's worth. Then it kind of takes a lot of the fun out of it. So I'm sure you've heard about the for sale ads that say, you know, $90,000 invested, sacrificing or will sell for $50,000. Well, to me, there's just absolutely no fun in that. So here's a little bit of tactical information, how I go about buying a part. Say for instance, on this 356, I need a door handle. This is the driver's side. Let me show you how I would go about determining what the you know, fair price is for something that's 50 plus years old. To check fair market value of a price, I actually like eBay as a platform because it's worldwide. There's typically a lot of transactions and you can look at the history of what things have sold. So when you go on eBay, you type in Porsche 356 handle, you're gonna see a huge range of price. And some of the stuff never sells 
for the price that's listed. But if you go through some menus, you can click on listings that have sold or listed, listings that have completed. And that's the historical data that you need to sort of establish what is a fair price to pay for a part that's pretty rare. Yeah, the first one here is a pair that would work for my car. 265 or best offer. I really only need one side in this case, but that's a good market value. Call it, you know, 130 each. But here's another one for 749 for a pair. That includes the ignition switch. That's pretty expensive. And that's it. So there's really only two that are complete. Some of them include just the handle, but no tumbler, no lock cylinder. That's kind of important. Let's click on this first one for 265. Okay, I can see some pitting on the chrome. It does look complete, but it's pretty rough. You can see lots of pitting. This is not even driver quality, so. Numbers don't match between left and right. Let's click on the other one that's sold. The chrome looks a lot better on this one. It includes an authentic Porsche key. The other two are reproductions. That's the ignition switch. Ignition switches are expensive. We'll look at that in a second. Includes the bezel. Here it shows the cylinders disassembled. Hopefully these aren't reproductions. I don't know if they are. No, they look original. Some of the numbering there is worn off. So much nicer set. Now this is what's currently available. A lot of them without the cylinders. There's a single one for 229, that's too much. Another one for 187 with key, not a great deal. It's also got some pitting. I think that's probably overpriced. The key looks good though, the keyhole looks good. And then let's look up the ignition switch to see how much that one's worth. So we look at used switches, completed auctions. Yeah, about 275 for the switch. So if we subtract that 275 ignition switch from the 745 on the nicer pair of handles, that's a 470. So the price ranges about between 270 and 470, depending on quality for a pair. And then I'll search around, you know, if there's a good deal on eBay, then by all means, you snap it up. And then I'll also go to some of my other favorite online websites. There's Pelican Parts, there's 356 Registry, there's Facebook Marketplace, there's carpart.com. I'm checking Craigslist now, Porsche door handle. Nothing comes up for my area on a door handle specifically. And Craigslist, so we just look at generic 356 parts. We can see if we can find any handles throughout any of this stuff. And sometimes you'll find other cool things here while you're at it. So it's worth a look. Craigslist now has an option of searching other areas, which is nice. Now I'm on the 356 registry. Let's see if there's any handles specifically. Looks like some earlier door handles. That's not for my car. A 911 door handle. It's not a bad price. Early door handle. And an interior door handle. So I didn't find what I needed here, but it doesn't hurt to check. 
you can see a complete door for 3000 uh, that's probably too much work, too much shipping cost. The door does have a handle on it that would work. Looks like a passenger door though. Yeah, that's too rough, too much work. Now I'm on Aussie Sales. They have a pretty good catalog online, but with most of these places, it's easier just to call them and tell them what you need because this is a good price, um, $70 for a one that's pretty rough and it looks complete actually. This is probably the best deal so far. Looks like they got several of them, different key codes. So I would definitely call these guys and, and talk to them, see what the best one is for the best price. $70 the best I've seen so far. They have some new options as well. And slightly nicer sets for 115. No keys. That's not that big a deal. You're going to be rekeying these anyways. Now I'm checking the Samba. We'll see what they have. We're typing in door handle here. There's some early T1 ones, very expensive. 165 shipped, this one doesn't look bad. Um, looks like it's just one side. If that was for a pair, I would say go for it, but it does need to be rechromed. Yeah, this is a little overpriced, 550 for a pair almost looks like that's too much of a gap there. I'm not sure if these are authentic anyways. Yeah, also needs a rechroming, so that's overpriced. And then there's another one here, 225, shows 250. Also a little bit on the expensive side. I think we can do better at Aussie sales. And then here's probably the best one, uh, $5 for just the handle. I did see some tumblers by themselves on, on eBay. We could go back to eBay and piece it together too. Takes a little bit more work, but you gotta do what you gotta do. And keep in mind, you're gonna be disassembling these anyways. And now we're on Facebook Marketplace. Typing in Por Porsche 356 door handle. And looks like there's a 911 door handle for 65. That's a good price for a 911 handle. It's missing the lock cylinder. Interior handles, 911 door, a lot of modern stuff here. Now Facebook will automatically give you things that are close to your search. They're trying to sell stuff. So you're not going to get just door handles here. You're getting lights, fog lights, brake parts. Nothing I need specifically here. Some Volkswagen handles. Here's a parts lot. It's a good example. So I'm going to, I'm going to click on this, see what there is. Here's some engine parts, the rear quarter window um, pop-out latches, some handles, some interior trim. It's for the horn ring, license plate lights, tail lights, two fuel pumps. So it's, they're asking 500, it does say or best offer. So this is not a bad parts lot, nothing that I need particularly, but you can maybe offer $400 and, and be able to make some money on this. Keep what you want. So this was just an example. I'm not actually in the market for door handles. I have the original door handles, but this was an example of, of what I would do. Looks like I would definitely call Ase e Sales. There's other few places that are worthwhile calling. You can call CarQuip in Colorado. You can call Unobtainium. They have a lot of Porsche 356 parts in New York. Einmalig is here in, here in Huntington Beach. I would probably stop in there and just talk to the guys uh, and also maybe post a wanted ad 
You can post a wanted ad uh, probably on the 356 registry if you're a member. Some people are gonna try to sock it to you with the max price, but wanted ads are a good strategy too if you have a few weeks to search. One of my favorite things to do is, I'm a member of the 356 registry, but you can go on that site and look for 911 parts. And typically, the 356 guys will, especially if it's a late 911, like, a, like an 89 or something, Parts for that, they're basically just dumping them. They, they, they're, they're 356 people at heart and the 911 stuff to them is just extra. So I will do searches for 911 parts on the 356 site or VW site and vice versa. I'll look for uh, 356 parts on the 911 site. And that just allows me to sort of kind of look for the best price or maybe they're trying to sell something as a group. Sometimes I'll search for Porsche a lot Porsche parts, uh, 911 parts, 356 parts, and see what's out there. Sometimes I'm looking for a door handle and I end up buying a whole back seat or something weird. Like I said earlier, I live in Southern California and that actually is a huge advantage for me. There are an abundance of parts and most of the stuff is not typically rusty here. Now, in the case of a door handle, you may not have to travel. You can reach out to the person and say, hey, I'm willing to pay shipping, I'm willing to send you a label, would you please send me the door handle? And I'll buy it sight unseen if it's a good price. One of my favorite sellers that you typically will meet on Craigslist locally is the retired Porsche mechanic or auto mechanic who basically has collected sort of parts throughout the years. They put it in their attic and now they're willing to downsize and I will typically ask them what else they have for sale and sometimes they open up a toolbox and I just make an offer on the whole thing because I know that the part I need is in there somewhere and I can, like I said, flip the parts for a profit. So if I'm looking for a $100 door handle, I will bring a lot more than $100 to any time I meet up someone on Craigslist. Um, I typically have two ATM cards in my wallet. I got a small phone wallet, so I don't carry a lot of cash, but I can get $1,000 a day from each account. So I'll, I'll typically be ready to buy. And if it's, a, if it's an advertisement that is a big Porsche lot, you know, here's three engines for sale or something like that, then they're just gonna get a lot of traffic on that site. They're gonna get a lot of phone calls. You gotta be willing to just buy it right then and there. One of the objections I often get to this is like, I don't have space to be storing engines and parts and all that. And I get it because I don't have the space either. I live, you know, about a mile from the beach. It's real premium here. So what I'll do, if I get something that has got bulky items, I will typically list those first. And I, I, I move those at a pretty aggressive price. So I don't have to pay a lot of storage. I do pay for some storage but it's a five by five unit. And it's also where I keep some of my inventory for a different business. So I co-mingle a little bit of space on that. One of the other objections I get all the time is I don't wanna deal with the shipping and standing in line at the post office and answering a bunch of questions on that. And I understand that too. Uh, what I do is I'm typically doing it anyways for some of my other businesses. So I typically have boxes and shipping you know, roll and craft paper roll. I have all that material sort of on hand. So it makes it a little bit easier. Plus I have accounts with all the major carriers. So I, I never stand in line at the post office or anything like that. I basically print my own labels, I stick them to the boxes and that helps a lot. Plus I also, also like eBay for, for its, its simplicity. They are expensive, the fees are high. However, if you have a lot of things listed and you're just tired of the sort of repetitive questions of like, is it available? How much is shipping? Are you willing to take less? You know, eBay eliminates all of that sort of obvious questions because if it's on eBay, yes, it's for sale. They manage international payments. They do like a consolidated shipping to places like Europe and Australia. So probably 30% of the things I sell do go international and eBay is great for that. And like I said, it's expensive, but I'm way ahead of the game and it just saves me time. I do keep track in a spreadsheet, each of the big Porsche lots that I buy. 
and individual items of what I think it'll sell for. And then I have it color coded based on if it was sold through a fee site like eBay or if it was sold direct by a cash sale, I put those in blue. And that kind of keeps track for me how well I'm doing and what my fees are and what my overall you know, net takeaway is on it. Generally, I do really well. Another question I get often is, does it ever get boring or do you just get tired of dealing with used stuff all the time? And do you actually rehab many of the parts before you sell them? So yes, it's a lot of work. It is exhausting and it gets tiresome. So I will go through peaks and valleys of, of, of effort on that. In some cases, I sell the parts as is. In other cases, I will you know, drop them in the um, ultrasonic cleaner or the electrolysis bath and just do like a 50% like a job on it just to make it look a little bit better. I don't usually paint anything because I don't want to hide anything, but I'll sell a, a bare metal part and you can exact, see exactly what you're gonna get and generally people appreciate that. If it's old and greasy and you can't even see what it is, then don't expect to get average or above fair market value for that part. A lot of times I have parts that are being plated, so I will throw some parts for sale in that bucket. Doesn't really cost me anything other than a little bit of prep to clean it before plating. It's little things like that that you have to judge whether it's worth your time or if it's gonna to be too expensive or if you just sell it as is. There's no doubt about it, it's a hustle. It's, it takes time and you, you have to be willing to kind of put in the work. I prefer to sell the same thing over and over again. So in that case, Porsche parts are totally random. You only get one or two in any given year of anything. But I sell these uh, engine test stand rings. Those I sell hundreds of and that makes it a lot easier to kind of keep the momentum going. It's a little bit easier to package and ship and do all that. So I prefer to sell my own parts as opposed to, you know, junk parts. The other nice thing about living here in Southern California, we have several Porsche and general automotive swap meets in the area. And so that's a great way to just to get outdoors and walk around. You can buy tools, you can buy sanding materials, you can buy all kinds of stuff new and used. The Porsche ones are really great. Sometimes people are just guessing at prices. So a lot of things are overpriced, but some things are definitely underpriced. And so it, it, it takes a little bit of practice to kind of know what the fair market value is. But like I said, I have those spreadsheets. I can grab them on my phone. I can say, yeah, that's a good deal. I should maybe get something like that. Or I can use eBay like I showed you to check out what other people are paying for that part. And you can make decisions right there on the fly to say, yeah, that's something that is way undervalued. Or if you need something, say, no, I could do better buying that from any of the other places I mentioned than I can in person. So sometimes they're willing to negotiate. Sometimes they're just guessing and they don't know. Maybe they think they have something that they don't, or maybe it's um, time to move on. So you don't buy everything. Uh, well, I, at one time, this was a few years ago, I was at uh, the Long Beach swap meet. It's really more about custom cars, American muscle, that kind of stuff. There's a little bit of Volkswagen, tiny bit of Porsche stuff there, but I found a set of triple Weber IDAs for 911 and they were in pretty rough shape. The guy told me they were on a doom buggy. He thought they were Volkswagen carburetors, 150 bucks. It's a great deal. I also met a guy on Craigslist one time who had some Porsche documentation. So I, I went to buy that and I asked him if he had anything else. And he said, yeah, I got some, some tools, some factory tools that I used to use when I was a mechanic. And so all the suspension tools I have for the 356 for checking the link pins and the suspension tubes and all that, that was a hundred bucks. And those are valued at way more than that, if you can even find them. Those are super rare. I think some people think this car was a good find, even though I wasn't the first person to see it, I wasn't the first person to make an offer on it. In fact, I didn't buy it on the spot. I waited to make sure I could register it with a clean title. So I had done a little research. I called the guy back and offered him $4,000 and I ended up buying it. Other people passed on it because they thought it was too much work. And it was, it was accident damaged. You know, it wasn't 
probably for everybody, but for me, like I said, attracted to junk, this car was a good deal. So hopefully this video helps you, uh, or maybe not. You know, like I said, it is, it is definitely not for everybody. Um, it takes time and patience, but then again, it takes time and patience to restore a car. So if you're suited to restore a car, you're probably suited to, you know, spend a little bit of uh, extra time on the parts hunt and trading and, and kind of, you know, learning more about the cars as you go. I think that's extremely valuable. But at the end of the day, you got to do what you do and do what makes you happy. And if that means writing a big check, then go for it. One example of getting a project done with a big budget is I did two projects at the Peterson Museum. One was a, uh, a Jeep TJ and the other one was a late model Mustang. And each of those projects were done in about eight weeks. And that was with tutorials and teaching young students. So it is very possible to accelerate your project by spending more money. And they, in that case, we had a lot of parts that were donated, but it takes money to speed things up. I posted about this a long time ago on a restoration video where you can choose, you know, speed, time, and money, and you can only pick two. So in my methods, I like to do the quality and the cost. I tried to minimize uh, cost and maximize quality, but of course that takes more time. So I enjoy it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm giving you a little bit of uh, opinion and more of my thought process on how to go about avoiding the Porsche tax. The only way to avoid the Porsche tax is to offset it with Porsche part sales. That's my opinion. I'm told it's even worse for Ferrari. I don't have uh, any experience with Ferrari. They're awesome cars. I would love to own one someday, but I think it's even worse. Their parts are even higher priced than Porsche and there's just a little bit more scarcity in it. But at the end of the day, it's only metal. You gotta be resourceful and um, that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm.